We we see each other on the on the sea of glass, smiling that we have made it and seen each other again in the kingdom to come. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. Can you turn off this one? So, um, uh, me and my wife, my wife loves to sing actually more than I do. Um, I found that out very quickly <laughs> in our marriage, because I'd wake up to hearing all kinds of melodies singing. Um, but there's a song that, um, that is a scripture song that me and my wife would sing before, either when we'd bring in the Sabbath or before um, worship. family worship. Um, and so that's the song that we want to share with you guys today. Okay. <laughs> oh, come let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joy. To the rock of our salvation, let us come before his presence. Let us come before our God. I don't know why I was so nervous singing that song. <laughs> Some, I didn't hit the, the notes that we generally sing together. Um, funny enough, the last, the last message that I'm going to be giving to you guys, I actually forgot my Bible in my car. <laughs> um, but um, one of the things, I think, Renny, are you getting your Bible? Okay. Um, um, Bible's everywhere. Um, actually, yeah, I'll just use that. Thank you. So if you guys have your Bibles, I want you guys to go to <clears throat> Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. And we're looking at what is the purpose and the reason for why we sing. <clears throat> why we sing. We had already read in Psalms chapter 22, verses 3, it says that God is enthroned in the praises of, e of Israel. So when we sing, the Lord's presence comes. And it comes by the agency of the Holy Spirit. But here is Christ, here is Jesus speaking through Paul to believers in the city of Coloss Colossia. I'm probably saying that wrong, and they're called the Colossians. And Paul is talking to people that have accepted Jesus and are experiencing the life that can only be experienced from, from by the imparting of the Holy Spirit who shared the life of Christ or the Spirit of Christ to every believer. And now Paul has given advice to people who have now known what it means to be born of the Spirit and to walk in it and what they need to do to maintain that relationship. If you guys notice, I don't know if... Uh, Jeremiah, if you had said it here, or maybe we were in class, um, where you're, or maybe it was Afterglow, where you said that you were having, your day was a little bit rough, but when you sang songs, your atmosphere would change, like your mood would change. <clears throat> so here's Colossians chapter 3, verses 1. It says, if you then were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand. Set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. For you are dead, and your life 
is hidden with God in Christ. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Then it jumps down and it's talking about how one can continue in the Christian walk and some practical things that Paul is telling to allow the Holy Spirit to have access to the heart and to keep our minds connected to Christ. I'm jumping down to verse, to verse 12. Actually, I'll go down to verse 13. Bear with one another and forgive one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so also must you so you also must do. Verse 14. But above all of these, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. So let me ask you this a question. If somebody says to put on something, is that, what does that mean about that thing that you're putting on? You do not already have it. Does that make sense? If I told you guys you are in your regular clothes and I said, put on your Greater Lakes Adventist Academy, uh, Adventist Academy, man, I'm terrible at reading. I'm looking directly and I still can't read it. Um, hoodies, as you're wearing, that means that you don't have it and it's something that you're supposed to receive. Does that make sense? But look at how Paul explains how you do this. Verse 12. It says, 14 says, But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. Verse 15. And let the peace of God do what? What does it say? Man, it's really quiet. It says, rule in your hearts. And then it continues. So first, what are we supposed to put on? What are we supposed to put on? What are we supposed to allow to rule in our hearts? So the question still is, how do we do this? And then notice these words, guys. Verse, oh, sorry, continues, it says, and let the peace of God rule in your heart, so to which also you were called in one body. And be thankful. So there's three things. We need to put on what? We need to let what rule in our hearts? And we need to be thankful. Notice this, verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. In all wisdom, meaning in, in, in the things when you want to discern what a situation you need understanding, let the words of Christ be in your heart and in your mind. Use the word of God to discern what the situation is. It says, teaching and admonishing one another. Teaching means to direct. So we should direct um, one another by, by whose words? By whose words? Christ's words. And it says this, admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So um, when I was in college, when I was in college, there was a point in time as my relationship with the Lord was growing. I went from trying to scratch, scra uh, grapple between 15 to 20 minutes to, to understand the Bible. And the, the, the counsel is that we should prayerfully study God's word. What is a simpler word for prayer? What's a, it's a simpler word. What's a simp when you pray for something, what are you doing? You're asking. So when it says you're to... It's good, still good. So when you are reading the Bible, you're supposed to be doing what? You're supposed to be asking questions. Does that make sense? Jesus, when he came, he told many parables. He told many stories. But guess who were the only people that got the answer to those stories? 
those that came later and asked him questions. Those that heard the message and said, oh, okay, that was interesting, that was powerful, and they went their way, the truth of the matter is they had no idea what Jesus was talking about. So Jesus only gave the understanding to those who did what? Ask questions. And, some of, um, and so when it comes to studying the Word of God, it's okay if you don't have the answers. But you should be open to at one asking questions and let the Word of God and the Holy Spirit give you the answers you're looking for. Because God is not merely... His concern is not merely about answering all, of, answering all of your questions. He wants to have a relationship with you. Many of times we want answers to our questions, not because we want to be in a relationship with a person. We want the answers so we can know what we want to do and live our own lives. Does that make sense? But being a Christian and growing in a relationship with God, that's not how it works. Many answers that God would give you he does not give you until you've lived a life with him. And after you had an experience, then the Lord would bring it back to my mind and say, Victor, you remember that question you asked me? This is the principle, this is the scenario, and this is the word of God. Does that make sense? Wouldn't you guys like to get an education that you first experienced and then the answers were given to you? Wouldn't that be... Have you ever been in a class where sometimes we're only learning theory? Who takes biology or chemistry? What are, when you're doing biology and chemistry, you have time in the classroom and then you have what? What's the, what's the other side you have? You have to experiment. Imagine if you had to go to chemistry class that had no lab. How well would you know your stuff? So why are we thinking that a relationship with Christ is about just having time in the Word of God, but not actually seeking to live it out in our lives? You not only must get the concept, you must also gain experience. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? And so, as, I was, as it went from me spending 15 to 20 minutes, then it became two to three hours because I would, the questions I would ask the Lord, he would just bring me to other passages of Scripture, and I kept on understanding. This developed to the point where my, I started telling my friends stuff that I was learning in the Bible, not because I was trying to look religious. It was stuff I didn't know. It blew me away, and I started sharing with my friends, and my friends were shocked. They were shocked that those things were in the Word of God. And I remember one time a friend of mine was so shocked that we were all in the lobby at Southern and he looked over this guy who, the gentleman at the time, I believe he was a theology major. And he turned to, his friend, to this friend of his who was sitting comfortably with his arm around his girlfriend. I didn't know that, neither did my friend, but that guy was actually listening intently to see if I was going to say anything wrong at all. And so my friend turns to him and says, let's say his name is Jeremy. <laughs> Not Jeremiah, but Jeremy. He says, Jeremy, is the things that Victor has said, are they true? And the guy was intently listening to see if I made any error, and then he leaned back in his chair, and he said, yeah, everything he said is true. And in my heart, I was instantly angry. And you want to know why? Here was someone who was studying and learning all these things in a classroom, but they were not valuable enough to him to share with people that would have appreciated it. If your knowledge only stays in your head and it's for yourself, it won't benefit you or anyone else. And I found that as I was sharing with my friends, my friends said, hey, Victor, do you do Bible studies? I said, I've never done a Bible study in my life. But I said, guys, if you want to, we can meet Friday night after Vespers in one of the, the, the kitchens and we can sit down and study. This is at Southern where we had the new wings now. And you know what, guys? I had no idea what we were going to study. I had no idea, so I would go 30 minutes early, and I would be praying the whole time, like, Lord, I have no idea what we're going to talk about. I have no idea what we're going to talk about. And then the guys would come after 30 minutes. Now, I'll tell you this right now. In college, after Vespers, guys are not necessarily going to spend time with the Lord. Generally, if, if it's quiet enough, they're even playing video games on a Saturday night at Avenue School. 
But when the time came around, these guys came into the room, and some, a good few of them I knew as friends. And we sat down and we prayed. And while we were praying, I still had no idea what we were going to study. I had no idea. And even after they finished praying, I still had no idea what we were going to study. And so guys started talking about the week a little bit. And then one guy asked me a question. And the moment he asked me the question, a scripture came to my mind. So I said, hey guys, let's go to John chapter so and so. They had no idea. I, had not, I did not know at all what we were going to talk about. But you know what happened? For the next maybe two or three years, we had a Bible study every Friday night and it grew. And guys would come. Now think about this. Guys would come at 10 p.m. at night and would leave at 4 in the morning. To this day, I've never been in a Bible study like that, and I don't know if I ever will. But I want to tell you why that time was so exciting. Guys were finding that the Word of God had answers to the questions in their lives, and you guys want to know why I was excited? Because literally the things that were being said in that Bible study, I had never known them before. So the Lord now, when I had my relationship or getting my connection back to the Lord, then I was so filled with what the Lord was sharing with me, I started sharing with my friends. Then my friends said, hey, Victor, do you do Bible studies? I said, no, but let's come together. And when it came time for my friends wanting to understand what the Word of God had to say, guess what God did? He showed up and he taught us all. And I kept on coming back because I was just watching God give answers to his sons that we weren't able to find anywhere else. And what I found out, guys, is this. God is more than willing to guide you and be the father of your life. But he won't force himself on you. If you come and give him time, he will guide you and be... One guy asked me, some of the guys asked me this when I was in the dorm room, um, it was a, it's, it's a valid question, and I understand it. He said, Victor, you talk like you know God. And the thought that came to my mind was, he's far more personable, personable than you realize. So is it maybe the time when you guys are spending the word of God, or even if you're not opening your Bibles? You're only opening your Bibles when Pastor Jeff is saying, read it in class, or when you go to church, or when I present. God is not a respecter of persons. He would talk to you as freely as he talked to me. But you have to, in, for every relationship to be, to be to last and last long, it requires you to give God time. But one of the things I would say, when you spend that time in the word of God, it's important that you're honest. Like, Lord, I don't understand. Lord, this doesn't even make sense to me. I don't even appreciate what is being said here. That makes me upset. What kind of French, what kind of relationship is meaningful to any one of us? Yeah, actually, we were in Pastor Jeff's class today, and we were talking about, Pastor Jeff brought this, you guys that were in Pastor Jeff's class, what was the, the topic for today? One-sided, what? One-sided relationship. And what was the point that Pastor Jeff brought at the end? Okay, so that we have one-sided relationship with God? Say the last part. You got fainter. I know you don't have a mic, but I heard everything until the end. Okay. That we have a one-sided relationship with God, and, and many times we don't realize it. And this is absolutely true. But you know what? God doesn't get angry with us. But he knows that if God, if, if God does not invest in you, you would never come around to him. And the question to ask is, are you going to respond to God and turn the one-sided relationship into an actual what? An actual relationship. And God is, will do more than you could ever imagine or think. So I'll give one story and then I have... My board, many, many times we, we were here, I was intending to draw and illustrate, but then um, the points kind of, the message that, the, that it was directed went another, another route. The reason why I sing, remember what I said, what does music do? It what? It attracts spirits. 
So when I would spend time, so after a while, I used to journal out the conversations I would have with the Lord and the scriptures that we brought to me. And I'd be so intensely in that, my mind would come aware of the spiritual atmosphere that was around. And one time I went to go visit my, my mom in Sierra Leone. My mom's a teacher. She loves kindergarten and she also teaches computer class. And while, we're in, while I'm in the other room, while my mom is teaching like second and third graders, my mom is very good with kids. But that day, the kids were getting a little bit more rowdy than usual. And my mom was trying to get them to quiet down. And while I was in the other room, spending my time with the Lord and journaling out what was coming to my mind and the questions I had for him, the Lord let me know that the reason why the kids are acting the way they are is because of evil spirits. And so I'm in the other room, and my mom's trying to get them to quiet down. And what I start doing is I start singing the scripture songs that you guys hear me sing right now. And do you know what happened? The presence of the angels of God started to fill the room more and more and more until the spirits that were manipulating these kids were gone. But when we expose ourselves to the enemy and his angels or mingle with the things that he does, the residue of their presence sometimes remains still on our minds. And so the, the evil spirits were gone, but the kids had calmed down a little bit, but they were still in a little bit of mood. And so now I came out because I knew the Lord was with me. I came out and I said, hey, kids. And in a unison voice, they said, yes, Vic, Mr. Thomas. I said, you know, my mom is trying to teach you. Can you guys calm down? Uh, just help my mother out. And they said, yes, Mr. Thomas. And they were all quiet. And when, and when I turn around, I'm walking back into the room. My mom looks at me like, what the heck was that? And I just go back in. The Lord wants to turn every one of his children into vessels by which he has access to everyone. There was no special power in me. It was more about me being connected to the Lord so the Lord could do what he wanted to do. In class, you guys were also talking about relationships. And one thing that came out as you guys were talking about relationships Many a times, the reason why we get into relationships is because of a void or an emptiness that we feel in our hearts. So many of the friends that you have are actually for selfish reasons. Not because you actually care about that person, but because they make you feel good about yourself. If they didn't make you feel good about yourself, I'm pretty sure those friendships wouldn't last too long. But that is only as far as the human nature can go. God wants his children to be a people that they would go and make friends with enemies. Because that is what God has done with us. Now, Liam, if you could possibly help bring that out here for me. Uh, no, I'm not the greatest. Yes, you can just bring it straight up. Now, I'm not the. I was in a. I was in. I was in, I was in Pastor Jacob's class with some of you guys, and I want you guys to take a wild guess <laughs> at what this scene is supposed to represent. Does this remind you of any Bible story? And if it doesn't, don't, it's okay, because I know sometimes my drawing work is a little bit rough. Does anybody want to take a wild guess at what this is about? Anybody? Go ahead. The time that God made the what? The head of the axe float? Actually, I probably shouldn't have drawn these lines. This is not supposed to be water. <laughs> so you know I'm going to just erase that because I'm messing you guys up. This is just supposed to be ground. All right? Yes, Gina. The Garden of Eden. 
How many think that is the Garden of Eden? Why do you guys think it's the Garden of Eden? Ah, two trees, right? Okay, some markers don't really work. All right, the two trees, right? Does anybody know what was the name of one of the trees? The tree of what? The tree of life. So I'm going to just put life. And what was the other tree called? The tree of the... No uh, the the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, right? So I'm going to just put no to no good and what? Evil. But what is the real name of this tree? What would happen if you eat this tree? What? You'll live, right? So that name is revealed. But the way that the Bible sometimes says some things, it uses another word to reveal something more. But what would happen if you eat this tree? So what is the name of this tree? It's the tree of death. Right? Why do you guys think that these two trees would be put in the garden in a perfect world. Okay, yes, we have choice. But why, why is it that these are the two choices that are being presented? What do these two, these two trees tell us? Jeremiah. Obedience and disobedience, that's correct. So if you obey, you'll have. And if you disobey, okay. But what is the story that these two trees are telling in the fact that they exist? What is the backstory to these two trees? So he says one is devil's tree and the other one is God's tree. The fact that when the garden was created that two trees were put there, it's telling us the war in heaven had already happened. Because if, if anybody who has never read Bible stories, they might ask a very weird question. Why is it that in a perfect world where God had made everything good, do we have in Genesis chapter 3 the story of a snake who's trying to convince who? He's trying to convince even Adam to do what? To eat from his tree. Early on in this week, we had, we had looked at the fact that when the angels, sorry, I'm going to do some little crew drawing. Let's say that this, okay, that red doesn't work. That the angels of God that were with the dragon they fell and God put them in a place that's called Tartarus, that is a place of darkness, right? And these dots are supposed to represent the angels, okay? I know, I know, this is not the best. Come on, just bear with me. So the evil angels are in this spiritually prison, but they have access to anyone if they come to what? They come to the tree. So if this prison is for those who break God's law, what do you think happened to Adam and Eve when they broke God's law? What? Is somebody, who's talking? All right, I couldn't, yeah, what did you say? They went into Tartarus because it is called a place of deep, Darkness. Now let's turn our Bibles into Matthew. Let's, I said in, turn it into Matthew. Let's turn to the book of Matthew. I believe it's Matthew chapter 24, and we're going to find out something about this place of darkness. Matthew chapter 24.
Matthew chapter 24, the parable is about, about if those that had done good, they had treated the, I'm trying to remember, the story is about those who, they didn't know they were treating Jesus the way they were treating him, and Jesus said, since you treated me well, you will go, and can somebody find out what, Pastor Jeff, can you help me find, or anybody who has a phone, because it's, it's the way that the, the story ends. Jesus says a statement that has to deal with the angels that are in this place. I believe it's in the 40s, and the story goes this way. When we find it, 45, okay, this is 24. Matthew chapter 24, look at 45, thank you. So it says, who is, wait, are you sure? The story is, the story is specifically is that there are those that felt like they had been serving Christ. But I'll, I'll, I'll tell you how the story ends, and so you guys can make sure it's correct. Basically, it says that hell, that, um, that, the, that hell was prepared, this darkness was prepared for the devil and his angels. Because the prison, when you hold someone in a prison, one of two things happen. Either they're eventually let go, or they end up dying in the prison. Is that correct? So the reason why God created the prison in the first place was to quarantine who? It was to quarantine Satan and his angels. But there was a problem happened. When Adam and Eve ate of this tree, the whole human race was put in the prison. That's why when you read in Ephesians, where is it? 25, 41, let's look at these words, 41. Okay, yes, this is, I'll start at verse 39. It says, or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? So Jesus is saying, the way you treated your fellow man was actually the way you treated who? Me. So it continues on in verse 40, it says, and the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say unto you, inasmuch as you did it to, the, to one of the least of my brethren, you did it to me. And then notice this, verse 41. Then he will say to those on the left, depart from me, you curse, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his so the everlasting fire that is being talked about was actually meant for the prisoners. It was never meant for humanity. And there's going to come a time where God is going to have to pass judgment on these angels. But before he does that, the universe is getting an opportunity to see, is God right to end these people's lives? But in long, along the process, humanity ate of whose tree? They ate of the devil's tree, so now God's, now the human race is in this prison. Does this make sense? All right. I'll end with this last point because one thing that is mentioned all throughout the Bible is called, man, I think I keep on leaving the caps off too long. It's called the sanctuary. Does anybody know the seven feasts that are in the book of Leviticus? In their order. Does anybody know them? In their order. If you go to Leviticus, the first one is said to be the Passover. And then the next one that is mentioned is unleavened bread. After unleavened bread is called first fruits. After first fruits is called Pentecost, or the Jews called it weeks. After weeks was trumpets. After trumpets, they had one called the Day of Atonement. And the last one was called Tabernacle. Now, what do you think the last one is about? What's the whole point? What do you guys, take a guess at what do you think the last point is tabernacle is about. What is God trying to do? 
What is he doing? What is a tabernacle? Let me ask you this. What is a tabernacle? Say that again. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes. A tabernacle is a place where people live. So the eventual purpose of this whole service is that God wants us to dwell where he dwells. That's the whole point. So the whole process is to reconcile us back to God. God wants to take humanity out of the prison so that we can again tabernacle with him. So the whole point of the sanctuary service is to illustrate how Jesus and God is going to free the entire human race. Passover is about Jesus dying on the cross for our sins. This gives the human race, so the green represents humanity, in Jesus we have a door out. In Adam, we all came in. But Jesus died so that we could come out. Unleavened bread represents Christ's death on the, his, him, him, being, him being someone who did not have sin. When it says something is unleavened, something that's leavened was used to represent, um, was used to represent sin being there. So Jesus represents the unleavened bread that when the Israelites left Egypt, they ate when the angel of death went over. The next one was called first fruits. This happened when Jesus rose from the grave. When Jesus came out of the tomb and when he rose from the grave, he actually took some of humanity back up to heaven with him to represent the first fruits of the entire human race that he would save. Not everyone, but those that would accept what he had done. Then we have weeks, which is Pentecost. Pentecost was tied to Jesus being coronated as king. And when he became king, the Holy Spirit was also poured out to everyone that received, that accepted him. Trumpets is to warn the world that the Day of Atonement is coming. And the whole point of Day of Atonement is that God is seeking to reconcile us back to himself and put his character in our hearts. And the last thing of the Day of Atonement is that all of the sins that everyone that accepted Jesus' sacrifice get put back on the devil's head. So the whole point of the sanctuary is God is using the sanctuary service to quarantine sin out of humanity and put it back on the source. So in some Christian faiths, we are told that when someone dies, they go straight to heaven, right? But what this service shows is that when we die, we are put asleep. And Jesus has to come back so that he can resurrect all of us to take us to dwell with him. And the only reason, the only reason why there are those that are going to be lost, because Jesus opened the door for everyone, right? Was because they chose to reject Jesus' power to experience the life of freedom. Does that make sense? I know it's a lot, but they're recording this as well. <laughs> so if you want to look over it again, or ask Pastor Jeff, he'd be glad to take all of your questions. He's, he nodded his head and saying yes. So the process of this is that God wants to reconcile us back to him so we can eat of the tree of life again. But today, you are set with a choice, just as Adam and Eve. Do you want to eat of the fruit that comes from Christ and experience the life? Or will you accept the mingling of truth and error and its results? Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, that even nonetheless, what you do in our lives is very grand. Um, but Lord, you also seek to make it far more simpler, even more simpler than what I had presented up there as a picture, that it comes down to a choice. Every morning, my siblings wake up and go to class even if they don't want to. We're grateful, Lord, that even salvation is not based upon what we feel, but if we'll choose to believe and say, Father, take my heart and give me yours. I cannot keep my heart. I cannot protect it from not only the enemy, but I cannot even, def I cannot even control my own heart. For many of my family here, there are many relationships 
There are many things that we get into to fill that void. But Lord, you had made us to be a temple by which your spirit could dwell in. But because of the fall, and not only Adam, but our own choices, we keep on making choices away from you. But we're grateful to know that, Lord, in Jesus, we can receive a heart and a mind that would not only choose you, but would hate evil. And so, Lord, as I'm leaving my family here, I pray, Lord, that you would make these things far more clean, plainer and clearer, not just in their heads, but that they would seek to experience it in their lives. And as they experience, they would know just as the slaves in the South found out that they had been set free, and as they stepped out, the soldiers from the North would fight for them to walk in that freedom. The road was not easy, but it is far better to live the life of a free man than to die thinking we are slaves. These things we ask and claim. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen.